You're now live. Thank you. Uh, an agenda was distributed in advance of today's meeting. You'll see that uh, uh, primarily we will be addressed uh, by the consultants and consulting state agencies uh, that the statutes uh, advise, uh, require that our committee uh, work with, uh, and, uh, uh, and we will then be proceeding uh, towards uh, fulfillment of our mission. When we convened in August, our committee held a portion of the first meeting in closed session uh, in order to consult with legal counsel for advice regarding uh, how to conduct our business in compliance with the Open Meetings Act, the Public Information Act, and state ethics laws. All our members voted to close the meeting, and in addition to the commission members, uh, we were joined by our staff, Matt Bennett and George Butler from the Department of Legislative Services, uh, James B uh, Butler, Jim Logue, John Martin, John Mooney, and James Nielsen from the Lottery Commission, and Eric Delfos and David Stamper from the Office of the Attorney General. Uh, as noted in the public summary of the closed session published on our commission's website, uh, the session concerned Open Meetings Act, Public Information Act, and state ethics laws requirements and guidance. No actions were taken by the commission and following the conclusion of the closed session, we voted to adjourn the meeting. At this point, I'd like to uh, get a motion to approve both the public summary of the closed session and the sealed minutes of the closed session that were provided along with the agenda for today's meeting. Is I have such a motion. Mr. Chairman, this is Rosie Allen Herring. I move uh, that we accept this uh, agenda. Thank you, Rosie. Do I have a I'll second? I'll second it, Randy Mariner. Thank you, Randy. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any Aye. opposed? Aye. Very good. The motion carries. Uh, so with that, we'll move to introducing the consultants and consulting state agencies under the statute. Uh, who will be advising our commission. And I'd like to begin with the representatives of the law firm staff, Statinius and Hollister, who are our consulting advisors uh, about whom a uh, memo was included with the agenda. So uh, Kim and Sid. Hi, Sid Freilich from Taft. I am Kim Kopp from Taft. Thank you for having us today, and we look forward to working with you. Good. Next, uh, from the Maryland Department of Transportation's Office of Minority Business Enterprise, uh, Mr. Lewis, would you kindly introduce your colleagues? Good afternoon. Again, my name is Earl Lewis, Deputy Secretary of Policy, Planning, and Enterprise Services with the Maryland Department of Transportation. I have with me Tracy Watkins Rhodes, Director of Small Minority Business Policy um, at MDOT. I also have Sabrina Bass, Director of the Office of Minority Business Enterprise. And I also have Cheryl Brown Whitfield, Principal Counsel from the Age Attorney General's Office for MDOT. Very good. Thank you, Earl. And from the uh, Governor's Office of uh, Small Minority and Women Business Affairs, Chantal and Gerald. Good afternoon. My name is Chantal Kai Lewis. I'm the Director of Policy and Legislative Affairs at the Governor's Office of Small Minority and Women Business Affairs. Good afternoon, Gerald Stinnett with the Governor's Office of Small Minority and Women Business Affairs, and I'm the VLT Operations Manager. Thank you very much. And from the uh, Lottery and Gaming Control Agency, uh, John was with us last month, but uh, John? Yes, good afternoon. John Martin, Director, Maryland Lottery and Gaming. And I'll be speaking with you very soon about the, uh, the program. And from the uh, Office of the Attorney General, Sunita. Good afternoon. My name is Hurley. I'm Chief Counsel for Civil Rights at the Office of the Attorney General. And I'm joined by my colleague, Cheryl Brown Whitfield, who, as you heard, is Principal Counsel at the Department of Transportation. Thank you all. I know we are going to benefit from your help and advice. Uh, ne next on our agenda is an, an update on the 
uh, e-licensing platform launch for sports wagering uh, and a report from uh, Mr. Martin of the Lottery Agency. Chairman Brandt, commissioners, colleagues, guests, again, good afternoon for the record. My name is John Martin and I am the director of Maryland Lottery and Gaming Control Agency. I wanna give you an update on the e-licensing platform uh, that uh, actually began last Tuesday, September 14th. And let me begin by going back about 10 months ago. Uh, it was November of 2020 when the voters of the state of Maryland overwhelmingly approved the sports wagering referendum by a two to one margin. Um, fast forwarding then to April of 21, House Bill 940 was passed. Uh, May of 21, Governor Hogan signed that bill into law. The spring and summer, we began working with our software development company, MS Technologies, on the e-licensing software that would be required. The regulations in July of 21 were approved by Maryland Lottery and Gaming Control Commission uh, to get us started. In August of 21, as Chairman Branch just referenced in your inaugural meeting, you moved to name the 17 named entities over to the MLGCC for vetting. And as of last week, September 14th, our e-licensing portal was available to those named entities uh, to begin the process. Um, tomorrow, we have a day for in-person public comments here in our uh, headquarters building. We'll wrap up the formal 30-day public comment period on Monday, September 27th, and then compile uh, those results before moving towards final regulations sometime around the beginning of November. So what's happening now is that our team of people are working with the named applicants who have begun the process to do the required investigations and background checks so that we may submit those applications back to SWORC for awarding the license and continue building upon the positive momentum we have to get sports wagering operational by late fall. That concludes my, uh, my update, uh, Chairman Brandt. Uh, be happy to answer any questions. Do the members of the commission have any questions of Mr. Martin? Very good. So moving on, uh, our commission is now tasked by the legislation with determining the process for uh, issuing licenses to up to 30 class B facilities and up to 60 sports, mobile sports wagering licenses. Uh, in awarding them, the commission must actively achieve racial, ethnic, and gender diversity and encourage applicants who qualify as minority business enterprises or who are small minority or women-owned businesses to apply for these licenses. In considering these tasks, I've requested that staff provide a brief overview of some of the business requirements associated with obtaining and operating under these licenses. So Matt, would you kindly provide that overview? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah. All right, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, your meeting materials should include a brief overview of some of the costs and obligations associated with obtaining a obtaining and operating a Class B um, sports wagering facility license and the mobile licenses. Um, and it's uh, it's a one pager that was included in your materials. Um, the first item on the list is the the license application fees themselves. Those are spelled out in statute, um, and those are a Class B one is a two hundred fifty thousand dollar license. The Class B two, which are the smaller entities, uh, that's a fifty thousand dollar license, and the mobile licenses are are a five hundred thousand dollar licensing fee. 
And just to remind everybody, if the license holder does um, contract with a, uh, an operator, there's going to be an additional licensing fee uh, for lottery to license that operator. Uh, the second item on the list is the, the background investigation. Um, and the background investigation costs um, uh, for investigations of the, the licensee and the principal officers, directors, and owners of the, the entity are going to vary based on the size of the, the entity. Um, so I think the, um, um, those entities are going to increase in size as the, the entities get bigger, and then the smaller entities will have smaller costs. Uh, the third item is licensing costs for the employees themselves. Um, at each employee that's involved in the sports wagering industry under the regulations that Lottery is proposing is going to need to hold a license. Um, so those, those entities um, will have to um, um, pay for the, the licensing fees for the employees. Um, there are performance bonds that, that each, um, each entity is going to have to have. To have. Um, and so th those are going to be uh, $750,000 performance bonds for the, the class B ones, and then $150,000 performance bonds uh, for the class B twos. Um, in addition, the regs include cash reserves. Um, the cash reserves currently are required, the, the entities are required to keep $500,000 um, in reserves. So these are just just obligations that that an entity would need to keep in mind when it applies for a um, a license, um, and then some of the other um, obligations that that entity should keep in mind are the the surveillance equipment and technology. Um, there needs to be um, equipment that lottery approves to monitor all the sports wagering that's going to be going on in a Class B facility and um, and also online for the the mobile applications. And then obviously there's going to need to be Record keeping and uh, infrastructure and accounting controls that um, that will need to be in place, and there are annual audits that that each entity is going to have to have to submit to lottery. Again, we expect things like that to vary in the the cost of things like that to vary in size um, with the size of the entity that's applying. Um, and then finally, there's there's going to be security costs. And obviously, security costs are another thing that's going to vary uh, depending on the size of the facility that you have. Um, very large facilities are going to obviously need to have more uh, robust um, security uh, in place, and then the, the smaller facilities may may be able to um, to comply with lottery's requirements with with a less robust security system. Um, so those were were eight of the um, the costs that that. Uh, we've identified and, and obligations really um, that go along with um, applying for one of these licenses and, and lottery uh, will be the gatekeeper on these and, and is in charge through their, their regulation system of um, um, making sure everybody complies with these requirements. Um, I do think it's important to note that the, the regulations proposed by lottery are still subject to public comment and that's gonna occur this week. Um, and in addition, the draft regulations uh, authorize lottery to modify certain regulatory requirements uh, for Class B sports wagering facility operators on a on a case by case basis, uh, including based on the size of the applicant's business. So I think as as lottery has has said along the way, they they realize that that these entities are really going to be of varying sizes. So if if some of the regulations seem onerous, I, I think it's important for for these entities entities to know that they can reach out to lottery and, and there might be um, options for lottery to consider um, as far as modifications that may need to be made along the way. Um, so with that, I will uh, turn it back over to you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Matt. I think it's very valuable for this commission to be mindful of the unique attributes of the kinds of enterprises we're looking to enable. I can hear, I think, okay. So. Uh, so, you know, moving on on the agenda to, uh, as Matt pointed out, potentially available resources to applicants, uh, the uh, Department of Commerce, not officially one of the entities who were introduced earlier, but the, the resource through which uh, a small minority owned business sports wagering assistance fund may be available. Uh, Darla Garrett has joined us. And if I may ask her to please uh, brief 
uh, our commission on the resources that may be available for that purpose. Sure. Do you have do you have the presentation or do you just want me to talk, which is fine? Oh, there we go. Great. Right. Should I be able to hear? Can you hear me? Did you give me control or are you going to advance the slides? I can advance the slides. Just tell me when. Sure. Just go ahead to the next slide. <laughs> Thanks. And, and um, next slide. And I just want to say that um, James Butler has been really, really helpful. Um, he's been uh, a pleasure to talk with and, and he's been a really good resource. Um, so uh, this is basically information you all know. Um, we have said that the goal is to maximize the opportunities for small and minor women and minority owned businesses to participate in the, in the wagering, uh, sports wagering industry. Um, there are three areas noted in the statute that we want to assist in, which is wagering license application assistance, uh, operations, and training. Go to the next slide. Can you go to the next slide? Okay. Um, and again, this is information you already know. We are identifying small business as defined as a business with 50 or fewer employees. So we're, we have three different programs we came up with. Um, they are all grant programs and, they, and they're all reimbursable grant programs. So the first one is that licensing and uh, background check. So basically, um, we will reimburse up to 50% of the licensing fee or background check fee, net of any refunds, uh, up to 25,000, not to exceed 25,000. So um, we're, we're gonna count on you um, as, as kind of our pipeline source for folks that you know are applying that are small or minority or women owned to, to uh, send them over to Commerce um, to apply for the grant. Um, we're working on building an application portal, so we'll be able to um, do everything online, um, and we're working on grant agreements uh, right now. So this covers the first part, application assistance. So it is on the back end, um, but it will reimburse some of those costs back to those small minority or women-owned uh, businesses that want to participate. Next slide. The next area where we wanted to help was with operating support. Um, and this goes uh, back to what was just being talked about. Um, some of the expenses that someone getting into this industry might have. And again, um, this would be a reimbursable grant up to 50% of the eligible operating cost, not to exceed 50,000. Um, and this is some examples of costs that we could cover so, you know, software, equipment, IT support, surety bonding costs, marketing, accounting, auditing fees, web design. So again, you have the um, eligible operating cost um, and we will reimburse you um, for those costs. Uh, next slide, please. And the third component is the training component. Again, this is a reimbursable grant up to $50,000 in eligible training cost. So again, this is someone they have to be licensed first, obviously. Um, examples of eligible training could be rules for sports wagering, um, learning sports wagering software platform, uh, taking a class or getting certified in sports wagering and integrity, security technology related training. And again, this is similar to our, um, our our training program, um, our partnership for workforce quality training program, is you. We look at the training. We decide. We we say, yep, this looks like it meets our criteria. Go do the training, 
um, show me the invoices and we'll reimburse you for 50% of those eligible tra training costs not to exceed um, $50,000. Next slide, and I think that is, that is it. Is there any questions? Love it, hate it. <laughs> and, and Darla, I don't know that those slides have gone to the commission members, but it would probably be desirable to get those into everyone's hands. Uh, sure. The background. Sure. All right, if there's no other questions from the commission of our Department of Commerce representative, our, uh, our next agenda item is a uh, briefing on the legal standards for race and gender conscious government programs. I've been learning this is anything but vanilla. So I'm looking forward to this uh, good advice from uh, Zanita and Cheryl uh, who are uh, among us. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. We did prepare a PowerPoint presentation that we wanted to share our screen. I don't know if we've been given that capability. Cheryl, can you share? You should have just gotten it. The staff here is working on trying to bring that up. Okay, great. Can you hear me now? Yes. Oh, okay. Can everybody see the presentation? I, sh I just shared it. I'm unfortunately looking at my own face right now. Did you um, <laughs> start it? Yeah, the slides are down the side. There you there go. We go. So are we now in closed session? Um, no, we are not. This particular um, portion of our presentation um, we felt was um, pretty basic constitutional law that um, most people will be aware of and understand and that we could do this portion in um, open session. And so this discussion, um, well, I'll, I'll reintroduce myself. I am Cheryl Brown Whitfield and principal counsel to the Department of Transportation. Um, Zanita and I work very closely together on these types of matters. And we've um, put together um, a brief, um, what we hope is a user-friendly uh, presentation regarding the constitutional parameters for remedial measures. And, um, what I think I'd like to do is to um, cover a couple of different things um, just to make sure that people are following some of the terminology that I use later. I'm going to start very basically with talking about what are remedial measures, what are some of the remedial measures that the state already employs, and then go into the constitutional requirements. And probably most people who are at this meeting um, have, at least the, the state employees, have heard about um, disparity studies and analyses. And that's probably going to be the, the last part before I turn it over to um, Zanita to um, act. She'll, she'll focus on sort of the emerging industries and how we apply disparity analyses to that. So with respect to remedial measures, um, you really want to think about what do remedial measures really mean? Um, a lot of people don't understand. Remedial measures really refer to steps that are taken to address, taken to address problems. Um, the purpose is to correct something that's wrong or something that has been done wrong. It's um, curative. Um, the, the purpose is to mitigate, improve, or eliminate a bad uh, situation. With respect to um, some remedial measures, 
they are what we refer to as race conscious or race gender. And race conscious and race gender remedies, those are remedies that are taken with the conscious awareness of race or gender. They're explicitly intended to affect uh, minorities and, and women. Most people are probably familiar with the state's Minority Business Enterprise Program or MBE program. That is a remedial program that is both race and gender conscious, and it applies to state procurements. The program is codified um, for, for the nerds out there that really want to go look this stuff up. It's codified at the State Finance and Procurement Article under Title 14, Subtitle 3. And there's also a very comprehensive MBE program manual that includes a lot of additional requirements for the, the program. It is a goal-based program um, targeted at contracting, and it applies to state-funded procurements under Division II. In other words, if you have a procurement for um, a project for the state, maybe you're building, you're, you're constructing a building, you have to, under the MBE program, evaluate the contract and determine whether or not um, you can establish a minority business enterprise participation goal. There is an overall goal of 29% um, for all state procurement in a given year. However, agencies, in order to be constitutional, still must set those goals on a contract by contract basis. Now, there are other programs that are not necessarily procurements, but they, so they're not subject to division two, they're, they're, they're exempt from division two but the MBE requirements will still apply if the General Assembly adopts pertinent legislation. And examples of those things are um, the, the VLT, video lottery terminals, uh, with respect to contracting, MBE goals apply. MBE goals similarly apply to public uh, private partnership projects, such as Purple Line. And um, the MBE program requirements for procurement also apply to the WIN projects. Where we sort of took a different approach or the General Assembly took a different approach is with medical cannabis. And there we applied not necessarily MBE program goals uh, because the evidence didn't really support that, but instead we looked at other types of remedial measures to um, help with uh, minority and women participation in licensing to try to, to see if we could impact the licensing process so that minorities and women had a, a better shot at um, obtaining a license for medical cannabis. So I, I said all that to kind of lay the foundation with respect to uh, the sports wagering, we're looking at a couple of different things both contracting and licensing. And we can't do either one of those until we really and truly pay attention to the constitutional law and make sure that we comply. The perennial case is uh, a case by the Supreme Court, and that is the city of Richmond versus Croson. And without going into all of the um, different, I guess, uh, twists and turns in constitutional law um, and the cases that have evolved since Croson. Um, I think it's, uh, it's probably best to just say that based on all of that law, we have two judicial tests. And those judicial tests apply whenever you have a program that's going to help minority and women-owned businesses. The first that I'll talk about is heightened scrutiny. And the second is strict scrutiny. Heightened scrutiny actually applies to um, programs, remedial measures to assist women and women-owned businesses. And this heightened or intermediate scrutiny requires that there be an important government objective and whatever measures, remedial measures that the government employs 
are substantially related to achieving those goals. The higher standard or highest standard that the Supreme Court uses is with respect to race conscious measures. And that is strict scrutiny. And strict scrutiny requires that there be a compelling government interest to establish those remedial measures. And those remedial measures must be narrowly tailored to the program to achieve that interest. So I'm gonna talk a little bit more about strict scrutiny and that first prong. Um, a lot of people are probably saying, well, what is a compelling government interest? Compelling government interest is the need to remedy the effects of discrimination. And that requires evidence. And generally that evidence or the documentation of that discrimination is provided in a disparity study. The second prong is narrow tailoring. And narrow tailoring really involves making sure that your remedial measures are targeted to remedy the problem. You can't identify one problem and then develop measures that have absolutely nothing to do with the problem. For example, if the problem is that um, small minority and women-owned businesses don't have access to capital and you establish a program that has absolutely nothing to do with capital, that would not be a narrowly tailored program. Other narrowly, narrow tailoring measures include consideration of race neutral alternatives. And that's an alternative that does not use or doesn't have any conscious um, impact with respect to minorities or women. And you also need to have elements to make sure that whatever measures you're using are fair and flexible. If you develop measures that place some sort of undue burden on another group, non-minorities, then you haven't taken the appropriate steps to ensure fairness and flexibility. Now, I talked a few minutes ago about the MBE program, our contracting program, and the state has complied with the requirements of the Constitution. They have established the MBE program law based on the 2017 disparity study. They also um, looked at other remedial measures um, to decide whether or not to um, uh, separately or supp supplementally analyze the information in the study. So some people may say, well, what is a disparity study? I don't understand, you know, I've heard, I've heard people talk about it a lot, but I don't really know what it means. Um, I, I will say that our, our statewide disparity study is a huge document, it's about 700 pages long and it contains um, statistical and qualitative evidence of discrimination against minority and women-owned businesses. Um, in the end, um, it ultimately concludes that discrimination against minority and women business owners in Maryland's market area is still a significant problem. When I talked about that statistical and qualitative evidence, the statistical evidence really ties to the availability and utilization of firms in the marketplace. We look at how many firms, um, whether they are minorities, whether they are women, whether they're non minorities, and we combine that total availability. And then we look at utilization to determine whether firms are being used at the level that you would expect them to be used given their availability in the marketplace. Based on a Fourth Circuit case, the Roe case, we also have to make sure that if we're looking at that information and we come up with disparities, say the volume of firms is at uh, 30% and we're only using them at a level of 10%, that's a disparity. 
The question is whether that disparity is statistically significant. And that's part of the reason why our study is so huge because we look very carefully at the data. We look at a, a huge volume of state contracting data in order to ensure using statistical tests that I won't even try to explain to you, but using statistical tests to make sure that it's not sort of just this random happening of uh, firms not being used. Our disparity study also includes other evidence of discrimination. Um, we generally refer to that as anecdotal. That's the qualitative evidence that I mentioned. And that's really um, tied to surveys about how firms are operating in the uh, state contracting world, uh, whether they have access to loans. And um, some of this is done by surveys, but also some of it is done with focus groups where we actually meet directly with firms to talk to them about uh, what's happening in the marketplace and how they're being treated by the state as well as contractors. So at this point, it's, um, I'm going to turn this over to my colleague, um, Zanita, and she will continue with the discussion regarding um, some industry-specific analyses and other things. Zanita? Thank you, Cheryl. Thank you, Cheryl. I think once you go on mute, then I won't. Yeah, I'm trying to, <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to figure out how to do that. I'm not used to using... I could find. Lower right hand corner. There you go. Um, I think somebody may have assisted us. I'm not sure what happened. Uh oh, what happened to our, the presentation? While Cheryl is doing this, just so you all know, we, we have operated almost exclusively in Microsoft Teams. <laughs> Hence a uh, little bit of the challenges here. All right, there we go. Thank you, Cheryl. Um, so it's important to note that when the General Assembly has sought to apply race or gender conscious remedies in what we call um, emerging industries, and these are industries that are new to the state of Maryland for which we don't have the same detailed information about uh, availability and utilization that Cheryl described is in that 700 plus page you know, statewide disparity study. Uh, report. So we're talking about uh, gaming again and the offshore wind and medical cannabis. What the state has done in the absence of that um, detailed data is to perform what we call industry specific analyses. Uh, and what that involves is a two step process. First, the state will perform an industry analysis to determine all the different areas of work that comprise the emerging industry, as well as their related costs. Second, the state will compare the data in the industry analysis to the data in the state's most recent disparity study, that statewide 700 page report, to determine to the extent, to what extent those areas of work are included in that statewide study. Next slide, Cheryl. So for sports wagering, the industry analysis, as you all know now, was prepared by Keen Independent Research and provided to the General Assembly in September of last year. The state then asked its disparity, disparity study consultant, NERA, to compare the data in the Keene report to the data in the state's 2017 study. That's our most recent study. Both of those analysis have now been circulated to SWARC for your review and consideration. Next slide. So consistent with House Bill 940, the next step is for SWARC to work in collaboration with the parties here on the call today, um, GASBA, the Department of Transportation, our office, to closely review the two analyses, the Keene report and the NIR report. And that's, we have two main purposes when we conduct that review. The first is to determine whether the state has evidence of discrimination to support implementing remedial measures. And this goes back to the compelling government interest that Cheryl discussed. The second key purpose is to determine 
um, if there is evidence of discrimination to support remedial measures, what type of remedial measures can the state lawfully implement? And that goes to the narrow tailoring portion, the prong that Cheryl discussed. Next slide. House Bill 940 requires consideration, I think Cheryl mentioned this, um, of remedial measures for both licensing and contracting activity in sports wagering. And if you compare this to what we did in DLT gaming, in there, there we only considered or applied remedial measures to contracting activity. We did not apply the remedial measures to the licensing. In medical cannabis, we applied remedial measures to licensing but not to contracting activity. So this is the first time that the legislature has really directed um, the application of remedial measures to both the licensing and contracting activity of an emerging industry. And with respect to contracting, the statute directs licensees to apply the MBE program to their procurement of goods and services, including construction and equipment that is related to sports wagering to the extent that's permitted by law. Compliance with MBE program goals and procedures may not be waived by SWARC in its review of um, licenses. And within six months of a license being issued, GOSBA must collaborate with our office and the licensee to develop a plan for setting any MBE goals. Next slide. Now with respect to licensing, and again, to the extent permitted by law, House Bill 940 requires SWARC to actively seek to achieve racial, ethnic, and gender diversity when awarding licenses. And SWARC is also required under the statute to encourage applicants who are small minority and women-owned businesses or who are certified as MBE in the state's directory that's housed um, and overseen by the Department of Transportation or who are otherwise eligible for certification. SWARC must encourage all of those businesses to apply to apply for sports wagering licenses. Next slide. Finally, we note that the legislature required SWARC to take several steps when considering remedial measures. Um, we've talked about the fact that SWARC must evaluate the Keen and NERA analyses. You also have to evaluate whether there are race neutral methods that could be utilized to assist minority and women owned businesses who are seeking to participate in this industry. You have to consider whether certain licensees will be located in an opportunity or enterprise zone. You have to consider allowing early access to those applicants that partner with minority and women owned businesses. And you have to consider the remedial measures that were implement, implemented in the medical cannabis regulations for licensees in that industry. These considerations by the uncodified section of the law should be done expeditiously and in a manner that is in the best interest of Marylanders and its citizens. Next slide. So that ends the first portion of our um, presentation, the public portion of our pre presentation. We imagine that you may have some questions, um, but as we have um, recommended, those questions should be asked in closed session because they will undoubtedly involve our providing legal advice. So we'll stop at this point. Cheryl and Zanita, thank you. Thank you very much. We're not going to ask for questions right now. Uh, that background, I think, was very, very valuable. That as well as what Matt shared with us as to the uh, uh, very complex issues that uh, this commission needs to bear in mind in issuing uh, the licenses we're tasked uh, with issuing. So. Uh, with that, uh, the next item on our agenda is a closed session to per permit members of uh, our commission to obtain legal advice concerning the standards for using race and gender conscious uh, guidance for the sports wagering industry. So at this point, I'm looking for a motion to close this meeting in accordance with section 3305B7 of the general provisions article. Uh, for our commission to consult with council to obtain advice on the legal standards for using race and gender conscious standards for sports wagering. Do I have such a motion? Bird Hash, I make the motion. Thank you. Second. Bird, a second. Second. Thank you. All in favor? Please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. 
right, hearing no opposition, uh, may we proceed to alter the logistics of this call in order in order to proceed with it. All right, we're joined. Are you trying to go in the breakout room? Were you able to go in the breakout room?
requirement on the 17th, may be able to do something with the other businesses, but I don't know about the 17th. I have to think about that and, and look at some things. And
All right, we, sh we should be uh, now uh, back in the live session. Um, the, 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 uh, uh, the agenda said that our, our next action was steps for the Taft organization. And they've, they've uh, had a lot to reflect on. And uh, 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 you know, does, does the, but before we even task them, I guess, I think we should act on the, on the topic of, uh, of uh, studies that we discussed in closed session. And uh, Randy, do you want to go ahead with a motion to that? Mr. Chair, I make a motion that we uh, designate staff to be determined whom and how to be paid for to uh, do another disparity uh, uh, review to make sure that um, what we're doing uh, complies with uh, the law. So, so Randy, just to be clear, would 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 that be a matter for lottery to lead on our behalf? Since I don't have any staff. Well, we do have staff. Staff is the lottery and DLS, and I think you know what I mean to say. The yeah. staff I, they can determine how to ex to expedite this. So, um, we need a motion. Uh, we need the study, and I make a motion that we uh, authorize the study by our staff. Is that sufficiently clear, gentlemen, before I seek a second? Okay, is there a second to Randy's motion? This is Rosie, I second. Thank you, Rosie. All in favor? Any, any further uh, discussion? I gotta get this Robert's Rules stuff right. Do we have, uh, is there any further discussion of the motion that's been seconded? Do we have to be any more specific than that? We don't have to do it. Was that Frank? Yeah, was, do we have to be any? Yeah. That's what I was asking the lawyers here. Uh, uh, Just, mm -hmm. well, do you do you suggest anything more specific, Frank? <laughs> uh, I don't have the words together for it, but I, it has to it has to reflect the disparity study on on information that was not. Uh, or, or just reflecting on the advice we've received from the attorney general's office, maybe incorporating that. Yes, that would. If be I fine. may, abuse my chair privilege. That that would be fine, sir. As I add that to my motion. Is that okay, Randy? Okay. Yes. All right. None of us wants to be here all night. All right. Any other discussion of the motion? Hearing none. All in favor. Aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. Sorry. All right. I think I think the uh, the I think the motion passes uh, unanimously. All right. Uh, the next steps for Taft. Uh, the you know the term brainstorming was used a few times today, and and we kind of hired them to be our our brainstormers. Uh, uh, may I may I invite them to offer comments on how they might uh, help advise us the next time we convene? Well, I think that the subject to receiving, I guess, the disparity study uh, and seeing what it says, uh, I think our our thought process is that the Class B licenses. Uh, aren't set up for running a sports book by themselves. They don't have the expertise. They don't have the uh, ability to get trained fast enough. They probably don't, many don't have the capital to do it all. It's a fairly intensive business. So we think that there's got to be some me mechanism that is going to be looked at to uh, enable them to get where they're going to be. And that mechanism is going to be partnering with the sports books, the 25 or 30 or 35 probably in the in the country anyway sports books that currently operate the trick there is going to be that the sports books are going to look at it and say well mobile sports betting is fairly profitable you know smaller margins but profitable in person isn't as profitable so why would i chase after an in-person deal 
uh, especially if I don't know what the population is, if I don't know what the demographics are of any particular Class B license, especially since there's exclusionary zones. So I've got to do a lot of homework is what the sports book operator is going to say relative to should I do something partnering with a Class B licensee. Uh, we believe that what's got to be done, again, subject to seeing the disparity study, is provide some information to these sports betting operators that says, here's some demographic data that we've taken a look at, here's some population statistics that we've taken a look at, and here's why we believe that you're entering into a vendor relationship or a partnership with a Class B operator uh, can make sense for you, can make sense for you from an economic standpoint. There are instances throughout the country where Big operators like FanDuel or, or DraftKings will, in fact, open up a sport or deal with a sports betting operation that is in person. They typically do it because it's an iconic Class B facility. They typically do it because that Class B iconic facility is in an area that has a lot of population, oftentimes near a stadium or something like that. Here we can't do that, so we're going to have to provide a bunch of information to these sports betting operators to say to them, you can make some money and you can embellish your brand if you find the right Class B locations to maybe you don't make as much money on the in-person, but it'll embellish your brand over here on the uh, mobile side. So I think that's that's the process that we've got to go through, seek, seek some data uh, and, and brainstorm a circumstance that – or brainstorm – such that we come up with a circumstance that says, this is why you, Mr. Sports Operator, Mrs. Sports Operator, should partner up with the Class B. You'll make enough money to where you're not going to take a loss. And, you know, on the flip side, the sports, the Class B operator will make some money, uh, expand its operation, hopefully, and kind of get the lift that the legislature was looking for. Uh, what that kind of means at the same time is that uh, I think we have to take a look at the interplay between the Class B licenses and the mobile licenses. I think if you just go out and issue the, try to issue the Class B licenses by themselves uh, without taking into account that it's got to be beneficial for a sports operator or a mobile sports operator to do it, you could find yourself in a circumstance where uh, the Class B licenses don't get picked up. So I think that we've got to take a look during this period of time when we're going to be doing the additional disparity study on what's the interrelationship between the mobile licenses and the Class B licenses, and maybe we need to do those at the same time instead of separately uh, with the Class Bs going first and the Cla and then mobiles going after. So those, I think, are some of the thoughts that we'll be discussing uh, with the members of the commission while the disparity study is being concluded uh, by being done so that we can be a little bit ahead of the curve. Very general remarks, but those are our current thoughts. Any, any comments, uh, questions by the mm -hmm. commission? I think that's, uh, uh, Laura? I, I just, I guess I, my question is, you know, if the consultants can provide any information on how other jurisdictions have dealt with this, I think that would be very helpful, or if not exactly the same situation, how okay. how have they dealt with issues of equity in general? Sure. I think that's something we can look at. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Absolutely. And Zanita and Cheryl, that sounds like the kind of brainstorming you guys were suggesting, you know, that these, these, these licenses are not in and of themselves gold mines for anybody. And uh, achieving the goals of the legislature is going to indeed require some creativity uh, for us to fulfill what we're trying to accomplish here. Any other thoughts, discussion? It's been a much longer meeting than I bargained for, and I appreciate everybody <laughs> hanging in here. Uh, for the next meeting, I, I'm suggesting Thursday, October 14th at 3 p.m. Uh, I did that on the basis of consulting with the uh, Taft people, among other things, to ensure their availability. Uh, 
I don't think we dare try to move any faster. I actually pushed for an earlier week and that that was a problem. So yeah, <laughs> we're not dragging our feet by any stretch. That works for me. I will say that I only have two hours available at that time, so I could not go this long. I, so I just it wasn't for lack of trying, Laura. Uh, <laughs> get us the heck out of here. I, you know. <laughs> I will have to disappear because I have a prior commitment with. Understood. Uh, understood. I, okay. My my goal with these is to get as much advanced material in people's hands as possible. On the other hand. You know, topics like this uh, MBE stuff was had to be closed session, so you couldn't put it out in advance. So, exactly, uh, the one for lack of trying. Uh, no, no, no blame being assigned. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like well things. Anyone else? Any comment, yeah. Mr. Lewis? Yeah, I say, uh, Chair, just uh, to point of information, the legislation that passed in 2021 requires um, MDOT as a certifying entity and GOSPA to assist as required with any study. So you just let us know what you need from um, from, from us and um, you know obviously we'll support it. Thank That's you, sir. And, and, and I know Randy and John will be grateful and uh, forthcoming. Any other business before this uh, August body? Do I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Second. Discussion. All in favor? Aye. Thank you Aye. all for the day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Be well. All.